It's absolutely incredible watching that sun come up over that horizon. And do you know what? That's been 10 years since I've seen that. Ten years since I had that moment with what is the finest carp that I'll ever catch. And yet the feelings are the same, the emotions are the same. The atmosphere is just as good as it ever was. And being back up here is uh, it's just an incredible feeling. You'll never forget those moments and, and all those years. An amazing journey, the, the most incredible time. To be back here now, after that period and, and soaking it all in, feels really good. Watching these fish out on the spots, sheeting and flopping over in the flat calm water. High summer, gonna be a baking hot day, just the same as you know that, that morning 10 years ago when I was sat over there awaiting that, that final moment. Yeah, it don't get much better than this really. I've been fishing for well over 40 years now and uh, 13 to 14 years ago now I decided to take a challenge up that was beyond my wildest dreams if I'm honest. Nothing can quite prepare you for that first walk around Burfield. The magnitude of the challenge that lies before you can only be realised by that first walk. It's not only a big pit, it's a really broken up pit. There's islands, there's peninsulas, bays, back channels, convoluted paths that run around its perimeter that will get you lost in the blink of an eye. And yeah, that first walk round all those years ago just blew me away. But do you know what? I remember getting out of that van with old Jim. It was a sort of late April afternoon. Beautiful weather. I'd waited for the good weather before I made my first trip. The first walk was up Moldy's Point and round to Pingewood. And I knew after that first walk that I was gonna just love this place. It had an essence, a magic about it. It's always hard to put your finger on, you know, it's, it's, not, it's nothing tangible. It's just that air of atmosphere that just revolves around somewhere. And, and Burfield just had the lot for me. You know, it was a bit wild, it was a bit rugged, a bit raw around the edges. Big expanses of open water, but small intimate zones where you just thought, you know, you could just stumble across that fish of a lifetime at any moment. And then, yeah, let's not forget about why we, why we came to Burfield or why I came to Burfield. You know, I, I caught some amazing carp over my, uh, my fishing lifetime. And, um, you know, I wanted something that for me represented that ultimate challenge. And, and at that time, you know, the Burfield Common had been caught so few times. There was so little history there, so little documentation that it held that unique aura of mysticism about it almost. You know, it's a carp, yes, but it, it was one hell of a hard carp to target and catch. If you're up for a challenge, this was the place to come. And uh, I, I made that first trip with all the all the anticipation and um, you know the butterflies in the stomach sort of scenario that you could you could want in in a fishing situation. With little Jim by my side, we made that first lap round Burfield, and uh, sure enough, I got lost like you would. Um, and sure enough, it was in that old dogleg section where all the paths crisscrossed and led back on themselves. But I loved it. You know, it was all it was all added to that sense of adventure. You know, those first few trips they were they were tough. You you you're just getting to learn the layout of the lake, stumble your way round, get a few landmarks, um, you know, find your feet, as it were. And, um, you know, after those first few trips, I realised I was going to grind a hell of a lot of shoe leather into these banks. And over time, sure enough, that's what happened. But yeah, moving back to that, that late April, um, the weather just got better and better. One, one Sunday afternoon, I sort of, uh, I turned up at the lake quite late and decided that I'd do a night on the shallows. 
the wind was trickling in there, the weather was due to be hot for the next couple of days. And um, I didn't have a lot of time to look around the lake, so the shallows was my first port of call. Um, the next day was blazing hot. You're talking 30 odd degrees. Um, it was it was incredible um, little period of, uh, of heat at that time of year. I spent the sort of afternoon wandering up and down the bank, watching the odd fish turn up in the shallows. You know, see, see the odd back plink up and the sun glinting off it and the dorsals are plinking up. And there was a, a rule back then. So the lake, when I started fishing it in, um, 2009 was run by Semex Angling. So it's a very cheap ticket. Uh, not a huge amount of anglers were fishing this lake at that time. You know, uh, there wasn't a lot else known about these, these uh, the other carp in there. There was a few old leanies, but you know, compared to these days where it's a, a, a big syndicate circuit water, if you like, you know, it was a different, it was a different ball game back then. So it was much quieter. Yeah, so I, I was on my own on this uh, this shallows, and Semex had a rule that you weren't meant to climb trees, or you weren't supposed to climb trees. But man, you just can't fish a water like Burfield without getting aloft at times. You know, you needed to get those views. So I took me uh, I took my ticket in my teeth and uh, took a chance and shinned up this tree. And uh, I'm so glad to this day that I did because. Within three weeks of turning up on Burfield, I caught my first sight of the big common and what a sight it was. And she came waddling in from the main shallows towards this swim that I was sat in called the 30s. And there's a couple of little dot islands and a, and a big shallow sort of gravel hump out in front of the swim. And um, I'll be honest, I thought it was two fish coming towards me at the time. Um, I was up the tree, squinting into the sun. There was actually a couple of fish smoking up on the side of this shallow hump. So they were, they were feeding like early afternoon. Um, anyway, I thought two more were joining, the, um, joining into the mix. But the closer it came, or they came, so I thought, uh, this two became one. And I realised I was looking at one of the largest fish I'd ever seen in the UK. Now, bearing in mind I'd just caught um, a giant mirror carp in uh, Kent called Two Tone at a British record weight. I had a fairly good gauge of what I was looking at and I was pretty convinced at the time that I was looking at at least a fish in the upper 50 pound bracket, if not 60 pounds. She was absolutely enormous. Long, wide, big old sloping head. And as she got nearer and nearer, um, I could see the, the distinct swell of her belly you got to remember this is, you know, we're coming up to spawning time now. She was absolutely full and the scales were stretched open, big white gaps in between. Magnificent sighting. Uh, and I watched her, she gently sort of waddled in round the front of this gravel hump. And um, she actually touched down a couple of times, you know, I'm not going to say she fed, but she was definitely interested in, in the aura that these other fish have created by kicking up the, the silt. Um, but she soon waddled round the hump and she gently made her way up the channel and, and out, of the, out of the little bay sort of thing. And um, man, I was absolutely, it, it was electric. Um, I've got rods out now, I'm in the zone. The Burfield Common has just appeared in the, the actual vicinity I'm fishing. So you're looking at 90 to 100 acres and I'm right there. The Common's been within touching distance of me and um, I knew I wouldn't be getting a lot of sleep that night. But, you know, as is often the way um, on those shallow areas, uh, especially in the spring, the fish often vacate them at night. And, um, you know, I didn't have enough information or knowledge of the lake at that point to uh, second guess where she might be going or might have gone. So I sort of stayed put where I was. And uh, the following morning, you know, she never turned back up. And unfortunately, I had uh, work the next day, so um, it was pack the barrow up, travel off back down the motorway and, um, and off back home to work. So, uh, you know, April came to a, an abrupt end, but I'd had that all important sighting of the common that gave me everything that I needed to see or know to realise that however long it took, however much shoe leather I would have to grind into the paths of Burfield, whatever the cost, I would be pursuing that fish until I had her in the net. Um, 
because she just looked like the best thing ever at the time. Hard to describe how exciting that is. So April moves into May and um, the next warm period of weather, I knew exactly where I wanted to, to, to look. So by this point, after, after walking Burfield a good number of times over a number of weeks, I've always fished fairly minimal. It's the, the, way, the style of fishing that I like. I like to be reactive and, and low key, but I realized that I had to strip everything back even further. Preparation was gonna be key to this campaign moving forward. And I knew I needed to be at the sharp end of it with everything in place every single week. So I, I set out a plan of what I needed to do, how to prepare my bait, how to get my kit organised, strip everything back, leave some bits hidden in the van that I didn't need to be carrying with me. Um, and the other thing that I realised quite quickly that would be beneficial, um, and I'd seen other people do it on the lake, was uh, a mountain bike. So my old mountain bike came out of the shed, gave it a quick sort of uh, small MOT, cleaned it all up, small tarpaulin, and I thought I'm gonna stash that up in the woods up here. It's quite a wild area, very overgrown. I started to get a plan in my head. You know, it took those few weeks uh, to get everything together, but you know, when you, when you do this sort of fishing, I feel like, you know, getting the plan and getting everything organized and prepared elevates your confidence levels. It certainly does for me. And um, just by having everything as it should be and perfect, meant that I could concentrate on the one thing that I knew was going to be uber important and key to absolutely everything on this campaign. And that was location and, uh, and, and finding the common as much as I possibly could, or getting in the right zones, let's say that. Um, so I needed to see her as much as possible and work out the movement of these fish around the lake under different weather conditions. So with two nights a week at my disposal, um, it, you know, everything was weather dependent. Now, to explain that a little bit, a lake like Burfield, um, when you're looking for this common, you need sort of really decent, hot, sunny conditions to go around, you know, for A, to bring the fish into the, the bays, uh, the margins, the weed beds and what have you, so you can view them and, and pick out which ones you're looking at. Whereas on the other hand, what we would consider prime classic angling conditions, you know, the big low pressures, fine drizzle, low cloud, all that. You know, realistically, you, you ended up fishing pretty blind on Burfield and um, it was all about just getting a bite at that point. So, you know, when you're juggling week in, week out with, with weather conditions, it, it, it soon became apparent that just stumbling across the common on perf in perfect conditions was only gonna happen probably a handful of times a year. Um, so I already started thinking in my own head what, what I could do to put things into my favour in terms of regularly fishing. So at that point I decided that I would sort of set up a bit of a base camp somewhere if I could. Now I'd seen a picture a few years beforehand, one of the first pictures I've ever seen of the common actually, a guy called Piers who actually runs the, uh, the calf just down the road there where we had a, a cup of tea earlier. He, caught, he was one of the first people to catch it at a, sort of a, a bigger weight, you know, I think it was 38 plus when he caught it. And I recognised from the photograph um, this old concrete armoured gun turret type thing. I, I don't know how to explain it really, but it was, um, it was on one of the islands and it was sort of falling into the lake. And it was a bit of a giveaway as to the area that, that he'd caught the fish from. And obviously having so few captures to work with, um, it was a start, it was a starting point. And this just happened to be on an area called Barnet's Point, which, which almost sort of cut the lake in half, made a very tight pinch point between what we sort of class as the islands and shallows end of the lake, and then the more open water, larger bays at the other end of the lake. So, it almost made an obvious place to set up base camp. You could see both ends of the, the lake, two big chunks of water from this particular point. And to get from 
one side of the lake to the other, they had to come past you. So Barnet's Point was going to be my sort of base camp for a, a number of months if I could get on the swim. Um, and as I say, back then it was a, a much quieter lake. Uh, so it seemed the obvious choice. What I would do from there is move to different areas of the lake depending on what I saw on my walks around. So there was a little window of opportunity in May, a big warm spell but with a southwesterly. And those conditions, if you remember back to April, were prime for the shallows. So I remember turning up, it's midweek, and unfortunately there were a few anglers about and they'd obviously had the same idea. They'd either seen fish or were there for this weather system. But I managed to slot into a decent swim, um, one that I knew that Nigel Sharp had caught the common from. Um, so it was the Blue Pool Shallow Swim. I slotted straight in there. I'd, I turned up at the lake at first light, it was, a, it was about five o'clock, and uh, I just sat there watching the water, and, uh, and as the wind picked up at, around breakfast time, started pushing in, just licking against the reeds, against the shallows, I saw a dark old head just poke itself up by the lily pads out there, about halfway across, and I thought, they're here, you know. So uh, I was set to work, got the rods. I was chod fishing at the time, you know, moving about the lake, casting, uh, at fish or whatever areas that were a bit unknown to me at the time. So it was very simple fishing, you know, just get, get the rigs out there, scatter a few baits around with the stick or the catapult and, uh, you know, you, you're away sort of thing. You know, this was to be probably my first real proper good session on Burfield. And uh, the first bite came at around 11 o'clock uh, that morning. Immediately I pulled into it, I knew it was a big fish, very heavy and powerful. Um, weeded me up a couple of times. One of the local uh, guys came round to give me a hand. I had to get right down the bank, get a different angle on it, and we saw this big yellow flank, orangey back, dark chestnut sort of uh, gill plate. It's twisting and turning in the clear water, and um, I was like, mate, that look, that's a proper one. That's that's big one. Um, anyway, eventually bundled it in the net and uh, and looked down. It was like, that is that's a proper one. Uh, anyway, it was like 42.12 from memory, um, one of the newer stock uh, of the lake, but I, I honestly didn't realise that these new fish had been getting up to these sort of weights. But talking to a couple of lads, they sort of kept it a bit quiet that, that some of these fish were now starting to push that 40 pound barrier, I think two or three at least now. So um, alongside the common, you had some bigger fish Quite a few uh, stock fish in the sort of 25 to 35 pound bracket, plus these old leany stock carp that I'd sort of heard and seen a few pictures of over the period of time that I'd been investigating Burfield. These were the jewels in the crown, if you like, alongside the common. These ancient old leany mirrors, stocked in the mid 50s, I believe. Um, maybe moved, some of them had been moved from other lakes in the vicinity uh, to bolster the stock of Burfield, which at the time was an incredibly low stock water. Um, so, you know, there was a good mix of fish now to go at. And um, I realised at the time that this wasn't going to make the task any easier. In fact, it was probably going to make it a fair bit harder. Yeah, we're drifting now into summer, that first full summer on the lake. And I remember uh, turning up onto my like, base camp Barnet's Point. Um, fish were clearly starting to gather up for spawning in Goose Bay. I managed to catch four small stockies all around sort of 20 to 25 pound males, milting all over my mat. I only had one night left and uh, I had a rod over to the islands to the right. And uh, in the morning, just as I was about to pack up, I caught a, a real strange one. I didn't know whether it was one of the the old leanies or I just didn't know but I, I did some self takes with it I knew it was a bit special this fish and it ended up it was one of the real old ones that had been moved out of uh, a lake nearby and slotted into Burfield and they called it the Cottage Lane Mirror but uh, it was a proper old character and a, and a real scrapper and it was one that I was to uh, cross paths with on a number of occasions throughout my Burfield journey but anyhow that was to be my last trip as I was due on holiday for a week or two. The hot weather came in um, and Terry Hearn, who was fishing on the lake at the time, had his moment with the common um, early July. 
and uh, you know it was uh, that that was inevitable. Um, great capture. It gave us another little insight into the common um, for a number of reasons, um, and one was the fact that it was spawned out. It was always thought to have been a male uh, up until that point, because every capture it seemed to just get bigger and bigger. But it had clearly spawned out at this stage, so that sort of going back to my sighting in April, that sort of made it all a bit more realistic. You know, I wasn't seeing things. You know, that fish was carrying and was an absolutely enormous carp. So, um, you know, we were piecing bits of the jigsaw together with every sighting and every capture that you learn a little bit more about the, the carp and the lake. And that, that was so important because it added, didn't just add value to, to the actual uh, history behind the common, but it, it allowed you to make more informed choices in your own angling as you went about things. But as I say, I, I sort of stayed on that Barnet's Point for a while, but things started to slow down. And um, throughout the, the end of July and August, it was almost like the fish had just disappeared. Like me and a mate, uh, Brummy Paul, we, we were walking the lake relentlessly uh, on our stints down here. And uh, you barely saw a sign of anything uh, until one afternoon in late August, I was walking down the road bank, Searles Farm Lane, and um, I saw a few glints out in the weed at range, got my binoculars. So when I was walking Burfield, um, I'd have little Jim with me, I'd leave the bike in the bushes, and had a bit of a, what I called a walking pack. So it was a little rucksack, I always had a bottle of drink, a few little energy bars like protein bars or a nut bar or whatever, a few little treats for the dog, his little dog bowl, pair of binoculars, and, um, and some bug spray and whatnot, you know. Oh yeah, secateurs and gardening gloves, because uh, it does get pretty overgrown and savage around here. Um, but that, that, that was it, and I used to wander around and, and, and I could sort of be fairly self-sufficient for the day with that drink and those little snacks and what have you. If I really needed to, I could pop back to the van, but you know, when, you, when you're hunting down these, these uh, really elusive ones, all the time that you've got your eyes on the water, and that you're looking at, you, you, you know, you're leaving no stone unturned. Every bush, every little uh, marginal spot that you've sprayed a little bit of bait on for, o over the weeks. You, you know, you're looking for signs that the fish have been in there. Have they polished that off? Are they flanking on that? You know, everything is of that. Every sighting, every little thing is of value when you're fishing a lake of this size and with this amount of nomadic carp in it. So. Yeah, that was a very important part of that first year on Burfield, learning these things and, and getting into a routine every week of walking the lake. You know, every day, once I've, the, the sort of so-called bite time was over, I'd wind the rods in, um, pretty much pack away, stash a lot of my stuff back in the van, and then it was walking. You know, the walking kit went on, Jim knew what was happening. Um, he loved it, of course, you know, a young terrier, it was perfect for him. Um, we were around all this lovely terrain, there's rabbits, deer, he was chasing around in the undergrowth. Great, great times, but it's harsh, you know, especially in high summer. Nettle beds are double overhead height, there's brambles clawing at your arms and your legs, uh, you're getting blisters, but you know, that's what it's all about. This, this sort of fishing is all about the graft, the, the learning, the, the absorbing of information. Um, and that first year was, was all about that for me. But what I had noticed off the back of Barnets was this area of open water in, in and around the ski lane. There was a ski boat club at the end of the lake. Um, and I started noticing early morning shows out there very, very consistently. And I used to sit there longingly looking at this area. And at the time, it was an out of bounds bank. It was an area of like uh, a sort of industrial estate and old scrubland. It was it was owned by the lady that owned the ski club, and it was it was just out of bounds as far as we were concerned. And it got to the point where one afternoon I just thought, you know what, sod this. I'm going to just front her. I'm just going to go and knock on the door. Uh, I was in the fire service at the time, so I always had the old fire brigade cards as a bit of a backup, you know. Um, look, you know, I've got a good responsible job. I'm not going to mess mess you about, but any chance I could have a bit of fishing on this bank, even if it's from like seven in the evening till seven in the morning. Um, I was gonna chance me arm, knock on the door and ask 
if I could have a bit of fishing on there. So that's what I did. She answered the door, I asked the question, and she said, well, you can fish on there, but you just got to go and buy a ticket. Go up Redden Angling Centre. She said, I've, I've actually just leased the fishing rights to a local match club. The old light bulb moment came on in the head and I was like, straight in the van, shot up to the shop. Can I have a ticket for that bit of bank at Burfield, please? Yeah, 20 quid. I handed over my score, got this little ticket and I was rubbing my hands together thinking I can't wait to get back and start exploring this, this zone sort of thing. Um, I did a bit of exploration, a bit of marker work, but as I just said, the fish were in residence down this road bank. I'd seen them out in the, in the, in the weed, as I say, with my binoculars on these walks around. And I realised that there was a good group of fish using this open water off the road bank. So I did a few trips around there, caught a few, um, but they didn't stay there for very long. I think that they'd been there for a while. We hadn't clocked them. And uh, by the time we, had, we took the opportunity to fish for them, they were ready to move anyway but I had this, this what we called the Rawlins Bank uh, ticket now, and uh, I set myself up for the autumn on there. And um, albeit probably I'd like to have started that a bit earlier, it, there was still time. Um, I gave it a few big hits of bait, and that period between September and November were pretty special to say the least. Not withstanding the fact that I actually got my first sighting of the common showing out in open water. So not, not close in visual stuff in the, in the bays or the shallows, but a proper show out in open water uh, off this Rawlins bank, which obviously gave me that very um, like key element in terms of where, where that fish was using at certain times of the year. So straight away, August, September, I was like, I need to concentrate some effort into this zone in, you know, in times going forward. So I carried on through the autumn in what for me is true autumn style. That's pretty static fishing on a big baited area um, in the deeper water. And yeah, it, it paid dividends. You know, that, that autumn was really kind to me. I had a few good hits and, um, you know, fish up to just under 40 pounds. And as, as it went towards Christmas, you know, um, the weather started to turn really, really quite horrible. And uh, on my last session in the first week of December, I did manage to catch a couple. And on the, on the last night, um, the wind changed in my favour, switched round to a nice southwesterly. And, uh, and that night I caught uh, another good fish, but it was a repeat capture of that old Cottage Lane mirror again. So um, yeah, I'd met him a couple of times that year, but he was most welcome. And um, yeah, the following week, uh, the, there was snow across the whole country and obviously that put pay to my plans of traveling. And I decided there and then that um, Burfield could wait till the following spring. But yeah, I was sort of, uh, I was itching to get back come the new year. So we're into now uh, year two. It was one of those up and down years, if I'm honest. Um, weather, if I remember looking back on it, was pretty turbulent. Um, spring didn't start off all that well, it was quite cold, um, it took ages for the fish to get going. Um, I, was, I was getting around the lake a lot, not seeing many signs um, until I think it was like really early May. I think I might have caught one or two small stockies uh, down the Pingewood end and then yeah in May I turned up and I walked the Rawlings bank one morning and um, I saw what I recognised as one of the key mirrors, uh, a fish known as the double-bellied fish. It was one of the old leanies, and I watched it swim from along the speedboat jetties, right along the, the length of the Rawlins bank, uh, in, a, in a particular route. It's gone round the peninsula and parked up in a snag. Um, watched him for on and off for an hour or so. Eventually, like, I set my stall up. Um, I've put rigs out into the, uh, into the area on the route that he, he or I'd seen him. And um, lo and behold, in the early hours of the following morning, I've received a take and uh, on shining the headlamp down into the net, it, sure enough, it was that old double belly. Um, it was my first of the, the proper, first of the originals, like, you know. Um, so I was buzzed to the max. Um, oh, these fish were 
to me and to all the anglers in the air, the uber precious goods, incredibly old. Um, and so um, I made a call to a, to a friend I'd made in the area. I didn't want to keep this fish for any longer than uh, you know necessary. So he came down and we did some night shots and got her back. But um, at just under 35 pound, you know, for a really old carp, it was, it was what I'd come to Burfield for. You know, it was that, it was that essence of Burfield. Those fish that I'd seen pictures of, three up, five down, double belly, um, cup tail, that, that wasn't here anymore, that was gone. Um, the classic carp, um, you know, these were the reasons alongside the common that I'd made these uh, journeys every, you know, on a weekly basis up and down those busy motorways, you know, 120 miles uh, from home. Um, you know, it made, that capture made, made my spring. Didn't matter what else happened, it was a key capture. The, the summer sort of, it came and went, it was like uh, we had a bit of warm weather, then it, then it fluctuated. As I say, it was a, it was a strange year, but there was a period um, late July, went red hot, and I managed to get up the lake late on a Sunday and um, got on my bike, headed straight round for the dog. It was prime dogleg weather. As I rode down, the dogleg goes round, obviously, into a dogleg and goes down to a dead end. We called it the sort of tyre swim area. And um, as I turned the corner on the bike, sure enough, I, I looked straight down the length of this bay and there was a great big hump sticking out in amongst all the, the pond weed down the bottom of this bay. And uh, even from that distance of a couple of hundred yards, it was clear to me that it was probably the common. And I snuck down, ditched the bike into the brambles and uh, snuck down with my little, cam I had a little tiny camcorder at the time. and. Um, I managed to get a little bit of footage of her mooching about underneath the scum and the weed in the heat down the bottom of this bay. Obviously it's lovely to set eyes on her again, but the priority was working out an area to get fishing for that night. Anyway, cut a long story short, I ended up going back up the system a little bit to a little pinch point, put the rods out, but like overnight the weather changed. A few other anglers had got into the area, that there was line pressure. And, um, and I think that chance came and went with the, uh, with the change of the weather, if I'm honest. And, um, and yeah, that, that was like that for the rest of the year. You know, I was tracking down fish in various bays, back and forth off the shallows, Pingewood Point, Alsatian Bay, No Carp Bay. I caught fish from lots of different areas that second year. There, there didn't seem to be the consistency that I really needed and desired. Like for the autumn, I dropped back into that Rawlings Bank zone and uh, gave it again a few big hits of bait, got the seed out there um, that I was hoping would keep the fish coming while I was away back at work. And um, yeah, it, it paid off and I caught some, some nice carp that autumn. But yeah, as I say, that, that second year was a bit of a, bit of a ball breaker, if I'm honest. And um, it was one of, those, one of those years of a lot of ups and downs. So I was, I was quite glad to see the back of it, if I'm honest. Those of you, those of you out there that, that you know, have got normal jobs and, and um, wives and girlfriends at home and families will know just how difficult it is to get out consistently and get to a lake um, on a weekly basis and do your thing. I knew that in my heart of hearts that if I could, if I could just use some precious holiday time um, to tag on to my days and maybe get three days a week on the lake in prime time, like so May, June, sort of August, September, um, at least, you know, three or four months of the year, it would give me that little bit of extra time to get bait in, maybe move about the lake a little bit, or if I was gonna bait one area and one area only and hit it really hard, this was my opportunity to do that. So I cashed in all my brownie points, worked hard through the winter, took my wife away on a winter holiday and, um, and she gave me the good grace of allowing me to use some blocks of holiday to tag on for this third year. And I was gonna give it my all. This was make or break for me. I was gonna bait this area uh, that I'd, knew, you know, I'd now caught a lot of fish from the zone. I'd caught an original. I really wanted to, to give it my all. And um, you know, with, with these sort of circumstances, you know, it's no half measures. You've got to, you've got to put everything you can into it, and this was going to be my year. 
And I said to my wife at the time, you know, I could catch the common, you know, if it does, if it works, then brilliant. If it doesn't, I've given it my best shot and I just go revert back to my normal sort of style of fishing. And so that's where we were at. Year three was an exciting one. And as it happened, the weather all fell in my favour. It was a good spring. In fact, on my first night back, um, I dropped into that old rolling bank swim in front of the scaffolding tower there. And uh, in the spring, there's a lot of silkweed over the shallows and the drop-offs. So fish chod, spread them out over there, throwing stick, a little bit of bait out in the area. And that first night, um, sort of early hours of the morning, four or five o'clock, one of the rods was ramped off and uh, in the net was this most incredible old dinosaur of a carp. Um, I didn't know, I hadn't seen pictures of it before, didn't know where it had come from. I just assumed it was an original from the lake and it was a, a fully scaled mirror. I mean, clearly as old as the hills, like a tail that had been dipped in old uh, black treacle, withered old pecs, um, an incredible armour plated flanks, all purples and burnished golds, an amazing, amazing carp. But I didn't know anything of the history, but I knew someone that did. And I managed to accost this fella on the uh, road later that week, showed him the pictures and he's like, yeah, that, that's come from Farnham Flint. And uh, in, the, in the winter floods or some sort of story, I don't know exactly how it happened, but this fish had managed to get from Farnham Flint into Burfield through a drainage ditch or uh, something they were doing and um, and it, in Burfield it stayed and uh, yeah it was in my net and I was uh, you know chuffed to bits with this capture the little fully an amazing carp but the year progressed uh, beyond my wildest dreams if I'm honest I managed to keep the bait going in on this area I got pretty much left alone to get on with my thing I've been doing enough fishing there for people to sort of say like you know um, you know, you, you, you're doing your thing in there, you know, crack on and we'll leave you alone. So, you know, there was, a, there was a good amount of proper old school etiquette going on, which I was always grateful for. So one of the main things I was blessed with that year was really, really good water clarity. That allowed the weed to absolutely flourish in the area that I'd uh, chosen. And so this big shallow apron of ground to my left was or became a, a great big plug of, of weed right up to the surface. You know, every time I turned up at the swim, I'd look out and there'd be 30 or 40 swans all over the area, all feeding off the top. Geese were out there and so would a carp. It, you know, it was the perfect scenario and I had the year to make the, the most of it. And um, yeah, the fish just kept turning up morning after morning after morning. So as you can imagine, when I was back at home, bait prep was the absolute paramount sort of, of importance. So, uh, you know, I was, I was boiling up huge quantities of seed, nuts, pulses. I was getting my boilies, um, I was chopping them, getting them into the mix. I was getting like a, a proper sort of rotation of bait so that when I was there, I had the stuff that I was gonna use for my fishing, the stuff that would be ready for the baiting at the end of the sessions. That's a time consuming and expensive project to undertake you know especially when you're using your holiday as well to do it but the whole point of it was to to do it to the max and that's what i intended to do and it was paying off big time those fish literally were turning up to order almost and uh, and i started picking off all the key fish throughout that year from late spring through the summer into early autumn all the ones that i really wanted sort of uh, came my way so I, I recaptured double belly. Um, I caught the classic carp for the first time, which, you know, is a real key capture in terms of um, historic common captures. You know, that, that fish has been caught more than a handful of times in the same trip or at the same sort of time as the common. So it was known to hang about with that old common. Um, so when you caught the classic carp, you, you felt extra close, if you know what I mean. Um, so that was a special moment. But as we moved into sort of August time, the, the one that had evaded me and one of the ones that I was really sort of desperate to catch, because for me it was one of the real iconic Burfield mirrors, was three up, five down. And this particular trip I've turned up and the weed was all over the front of my swim. The, 
the boats have been charging up and down all weekend, carving up these big weed beds. It was floating everywhere. Um, made it really difficult to, to get any sort of line lay. If you did get a rig out there, it was just dragged off the spot almost instantly by these big floating weed bugs. So uh, my good mate Brummy, he shot up the shop and got me a couple of these old sea grappling leads. And I set to work one afternoon and, uh, and I worked my arse off into the evening um, in blisteringly hot conditions until I had these mountains of weed either side of the swim. Um, and these two beautiful channels leading out to my spots. So it was back to game on and I was chuffed to bits. Um, well, that night, the first bite was um, an incredible old broken linear um, that I believe was, yeah, you know, uh, probably the first time it had been caught over 40 pounds. Great big gob on it, like a coffee cup. Um, lovely, great big scales. As I say, a broken linear pattern to its, uh, on its flanks. Within an hour and a half or so, I've received another take on my right hand rod and a uh, real slow dour battle out in the lake. It gently drew her closer and uh, in the half light of dawn, <clears throat> I've netted this fish, looked down into the net and that classic three up, five down scale pattern stared back at me from the net and I knew that she'd finally graced me uh, with her presence, this ancient old leany. And what an amazing brace, you know, the old and the new. Uh, you know, this, this incredible old uh, broken linear and this amazing ancient old battle-scarred warrior of a, of a mirror carp, you know, that had survived the ravages of many, many winters in, uh, in Burfield's icy cold waters. So, um, yeah, a special moment for me and, uh, you know, one of my, you know, memorable defining moments of uh, my fishing on Burfield. But, um, yeah, that, that summer was just one of the most incredible spells of fishing that I'd ever had, I think, you know. Yeah, I'd, I'd been able to put in that little bit more time, but along with that time went a lot more effort and a lot more um, sort of stress comes with that as well, you know, making sure you're getting back every single week. I couldn't afford to not put that bait in. And um, yeah, all the key fish seemed to be turning up at some point, the Saddleback Common, the Tiger Nut Mirror, uh, that, that, that came, I think on the, is it the new moon or the full moon? I can't remember, it's so long ago now. But yeah, that came on one of the moons at the end of August, uh, at, a, at a big weight as well, 47.10. I think it was a late record mirror at the time. Um, big old uh, big old bruiser of a, of a mirror she was. And um, you know, it felt to me at that time that anything was possible that the very next bite could be the common at any time. You know, I knew she must have been out there on that baited zone with those other fish. The old leanies were out there. All the big giants of the lake had been out there at some point. Um, the rarer ones as well. I was just convinced that common was out there. And of course, if you remember back, I'd seen a show out there in September on that first year. It just felt like everything was coming together. This had to be my year. But as autumn went on, the, the, the bite slowed up a little bit. And as we went into October, a good friend of mine, John, was fishing one of the bays. He'd been doing some, uh, some time in there from, uh, from late summer, working away. And one frosty night, middle of October, he, he, had, his, uh, he had his moment with that big old common. And, um, and for me, realistically, that was the end of the the line for year three. You know, the common had been out. It was late, it was mid to late October now. The chances of her doing another bite were slim to almost non-existent. And I'd burnt up and used so much energy, so much time, so much of my resources that I just thought it was only fair to draw a line under it for the year and uh, spend some time back with my, my wife and getting jobs done around the house that had been neglected, let's say, for, for, for the bulk of that spring and summer period. Year three, the winter came and uh, I had a lot of a lot of thinking to do, a lot of uh, assessment to to uh, to do. So I'd, I'd spent two years running around the pond, basically, chasing the fish, casting at shows, fishing for drops, um, spread baiting. I then sort of concentrated my efforts on this 
um, this Rawlins bank for periods of time during those few years, which had been very successful. And then I'd spent the third year fishing flat out, huge volumes of bait, trying to draw the fish to me, working in my favour as a travelling angler, you know, uh, saved me all that um, running about. I was like creating a, as my mate cycles at a bird table out there that they were just turning up to, you know, for, for breakfast every morning. But it, it wasn't sustainable in the, in the long run, in the long term. And not only that, it hadn't produced the common or the tactics hadn't produced the common for me at that time. So I, I looked at a number of options that I had. A, it was go back to chasing around the pond, looking for opportunities, looking for the common, which is great in, you know, in retrospect thinking, yeah, you know, if the weather's in my favor, I've got a good chance. But the reality of it is that quite often the weather isn't in your favour and you have to take what comes. So I needed a bit of both in a way and a sort of a little gift was handed to me in terms of, of, of another ticket for another venue. And, and what, that, what that did, it, it gave me somewhere else to fish so that I didn't put my, all my, I'm an all or nothing sort of guy. So if the opportunity presented itself back on that baited spot, I think if I didn't have this other ticket, I would have just been recreating the exact scenario from the year before. And this stopped me doing that. So I was able to bait it little and often. And I was also able to look for opportunities around the lake on the perfect weather conditions whilst I was fishing this other lake at Dinton down the road. Um, so I had the best of both worlds. I almost had the best of all three worlds. I had another lake to fish, which took the pressure off me a little bit. I could still bait my zone, but not create this massive sort of zone that all the carp were turning up to the party all the time and it was difficult to get through to the ones I wanted. Plus it was enabling me to visit the lake at the best times. So as soon as I thought the weather was prime, I'd be here looking for the common, looking for those opportunities. So it was a lot of balls to juggle, but it was doable. With a bit of forethought, a bit of planning, a bit of hard work, um, it was a doable thing. And it was something that I was going to enjoy. And it felt like it was that extra challenge to the Burfield puzzle, if you like, which just made it all the more appealing in a way, you know. Sometimes you feel like you're a bit masochistic in some terms, you know. If you're going to do it, do it full bore and uh, take, you know, roll with the punches almost, you know. So uh, that was how year four was going to pan out. Um, bit of spring fishing, chasing them about with the chods and hinges and whatnot. Keep a little bit of bait going in on that spot that I'd worked so hard on for the, the last sort of two and a half years. And start a new ticket at Dinton, really exciting ticket. Um, lots of big fish, only just down the road, enabled me to come and go from Burfield at will. Uh, and that's how it panned out. We're getting to the sort of real crux of it now, the real meat and bones of my Burfield story. We're coming to that, that, that sort of uh, exciting build up, that crescendo almost. And, uh, and that coincided with high summer. Um, so it was July, big heat wave came in, I've been tricking a little bit of bait out in open water, but not fishing it. Been running around the bays a little bit. So I've packed up from Dinton at the start of this hot phase, driven to Burfield, gone straight into uh, the bay system. Been fishing Weedy Bay and the dog leg quite a bit. Um, dropped into Weedy Bay for the night. The following morning, I've woken up, the sun's beating in on me. I mean, a great big nettle bed. It's, it's a bit of a hellish swim, if I'm perfectly honest, when the weather's hot. And, um, and I've stood up, looking over the top of these nettles out in, on the bay, it's flat calm. And I've seen a group of fish come in from the, from the channel. Now I could clearly clock, there was three small fish with the group, but there was one absolute submarine and it was the common. Um, she's come into the bay, headed straight for a bush, one of her favourite sort of haunts, <coughs> parked up, 
while these other mirrors sort of scooted around the weed beds and whatnot. So there I am, stood in my underpants behind this great big nettle bed, watching the fish of my dreams skulking about under this bush down to my left. And uh, the sun's beating in on me and I'm thinking, what, what is my best chance of a bite is potentially about to happen. I've got two rigs, one on the end of a bar, one in slightly deeper water, but what I had got was a great big horseshoe band of weed between me and the fish. And um, over the course of the next hour or two, while I stood there baking in this heat, sweat dripping off me, um, I watched the common mill around the area, but she would not come past that band of weed. And the more the hours drew on, the more worried I became that, that this big plug of weed was, was gonna stop her getting to the hook baits and that she was gonna favor going down this dog leg system. The more I watched her behavior, the more and more it looked like the dog leg was favorable. So I had to make a decision and fast. And that was, I was gonna pack all my kit up, move it around the riverbank, go into a little swim where she'd been caught a couple of times before and uh, take my chances in there. It wasn't a swim that I'd done loads of time in, but I'd done a few nights. I'd knew the spot, I'd put a bit of bait on it during the course of the spring. So it was gonna be an easy move in terms of getting a rig in position, getting myself sorted out. And um, I decided to make the move there and then. So wrapped up everything on the barra, round the river bank, down into this little, uh, this little swim, rod in position. Um, I've decided to use tigers because the bay was notorious for tench. So lowered the tigers on the spot, just a few dotted around. It was a lower inch, it's literally under the rod tip, the spot. Um, set my brolly up, up in the bushes, bit of camo netting, bit of mozzie netting, and um, just chilled out every now and again, just sort of having a look over the mozzie net to, uh, to see whether the common was in the, uh, in the mix. Well, a couple of hours went by and I started to get itchy feet a little bit. I wanted to look at the spot. I wanted to look into the channel and um, I decided there was a big, big willow tree and there was a bit of shade there. Decided to stand by this willow tree. I've been may maybe looking in for 10 minutes or so and I see one of the lily pads move and uh, it, it, there was a shimmer to the water as though there were maybe like a shoulder perch underneath the surface just moving. I've, I've like wiped the sweat from my brow and adjusted me Polaroids just in time to see this great big set of white lips appear from underneath the lily pads and uh, out she came, like the head just sort of appeared, like this giant, uh, incredible sighting. Um, I mean, I'm talking no more than half a rod length from where I'm standing. I'm watching the, the head and shoulders of the Burfield Common appear from under a big set of lily pads. Um, magnificent, I could see her eye rolling around in the socket, just checking everything out. And eventually the humps come out of the water, she's pushed her back out, and waddled her way across the bay. Just incredible. I stood there in, with my, my jaw, I picked my jaw up off the floor thinking, only 30 seconds ago, her belly must have been almost scraping my rig. It was that close. Um, so exciting, just electric. Anyway, she made her way off down the dog leg system and I, I took the chance of, uh, going off and watching her for a while. So I pulled the rig out, went out and found her. And um, as soon as she made the move to come back, I legged it back to the swim, nearly knocked myself out in the process, trying to duck underneath one of the fallen trees. Um, but got the rod back in, got my netting back up, just in time to see the common re reappear in this, in this little intimate bay. And, uh, and that evening, uh, ultra memorable, Good old Jim, bless his heart. He, he just laid under the bed chair, made not a sound as the old common just bobbed around this bay. I mean, I thought that night was gonna be the night that I put the Burfield common in the net. It just felt like it was my time. Um, she was in the area, she'd stayed, she was comfortable and uh, it just felt right. It was on a, on a moon phase and everything felt like in terms of a capture, it was all gonna happen. But, you know, like with many moments on Burfield, the chance fades away almost as quickly as it starts. And um, the following day, nothing had happened. The common had vacated the area 
and I was back to work the following day. It was game over. Um, but I couldn't get it out of my head. Um, you know, I needed to get back for the, for the, uh, for the next sort of full moon. I, I was sure she would be back in the area on the full moon, but I think I did, I think I took some holiday and did four nights back in the zone, moving backwards and forwards from the little intimate bay to the red ant corner. I think I actually did a night on Goose Bay as well, um, just to see, you know, just to listen at night. I used to stay up late at night listening, um, nothing. So I came away from there scratching my head, um, thinking, uh, you know, what's the next move? I put a little bit of bait out on my open water spot and it was, uh, it was late that evening. I, did, I, I put the bait out around 11 o'clock that night. Um, had a long drive home back to Kent and I was sort of thinking, well, do you know what? Like, it might be a little bit early, but there's that September show out in the open water off that scaffold swim. Um, the one that I'd always worked towards for the autumn campaign. Um, I thought, yeah, it's going to be mid-August, but hey, you know, you've got a good moon phase coming in, a new moon, um, good weather, forecast, light southerlies, 25 degrees. Everything's looking cock on for that zone, to be fair. So the plan was get back, do a couple of nights on that bait, just two rods, one right on the little baited strip, one just dropped off in the deeper water. If nothing occurred or I didn't see anything out there, I could always drop back into the bay system from the last night, get a bit of bait in there and start the autumn process rolling like that. Just a little bit earlier than normal. So yeah, I remember looking back on it, the, the date sort of had, had a relevance because um, four years prior to that, I'd caught two-tone on the 16th of August on a full moon. Well, I, I was turning up on the 16th of August to fish into a new moon on the 17th with this lovely weather system coming in. So it's going from flat calm, high pressure, to a lovely steady south uh, southerly wind, um, 25 degrees on a new moon the following day. Everything looked cock on. So when I've turned up to the lake and nobody is on the lake, I've done my usual lap, no one here, and there was an atmosphere. Yeah, of course, in retrospect, you can think that, but it was, everything was, seemed right. So rods are out, the night was very quiet, <clears throat> no bream, but the interesting and really poignant thing about that following day that Friday the 17th of August, was that being really hot in the middle of August, I was expecting the boats to come out early. So by the time I've had my breakfast, I'm really considering um, reeling the rods in. As soon as I hear those motors fire up in the speedboat club, I'd winch the rods in, sort of put them away back in the van, go for a mooch around the lake, maybe go for a breakfast at the cafe or whatever, maybe a pint at the pub in the old cunning man. Um, you know, it was hot, it's holiday season. Yeah, the, you know, the days, they're, they're, they're long days. When you've got a reel in <coughs> and the boats are firing up and down, it's a long old day. So you've got to find stuff to occupy yourself. And uh, a nice cold pint in the pub and uh, something to eat is, is ideal. Um, and, you know, get back to the swim for the evening. But anyway, this morning, it was nine o'clock, half past nine, I kept looking at my watch. No boats. Anyway, old Jim was chilled out. I was having a few coffees. I'd had my breakfast. Blackberries off the bushes behind me. It was just a lovely, lovely morning. And still no boats. 11 o'clock, no boats. The wind's puffing up. It's getting, you know, I can't remember, it must have been 15 to 18 mile an hour straight southerly, blowing straight into my swim. Um, I've got two rods out there on the spots. Tips are under the water, but what I noticed around 11 o'clock was that it was quite a weed build up on the tips. I'd had no bleeps using big heavy bobbins, but the tips were bent down further than they normally would be. And I went and had a quick look and there's a, a lot of Canadian built up on both tips. And I'm looking out there, there's no birds out there. There's no boats been out there. I'm thinking, those carp are out there, they, they've, they've been having it this morning. I was surprised I hadn't had a bite. But don't forget, I'd, I'd 
retreated right back with the baiting. I'd only been putting in a little handful of hemp, a little handful of chopped boilies, a few whole boilies on a regular basis. Nothing major. And I think this has made, made a fair difference. The bream weren't on me and neither were the, the, the big shoal, you know, the big shoals of uh, stockies that used to come in and give me multiple bites in the morning just weren't in attendance. So it was good, it was game on. Um, midday came and went, and uh, I, I was still in astonishment as to uh, how I'd managed to keep the rods in for so long, but I was happy enough, it looked good out there. The water had that sparkling element to it, you know, like dancing diamonds on the chop. It was just beautiful water quality, the sun was beating down, it was a mega, mega day. And um, I was happy just to sit it out, if I'm perfectly honest with you. It was like one of those days that I was happy to chill out, kick back and, um, and just enjoy the moment. I'd actually looked at my phone and the, uh, the moon phase was coming in around sort of two o'clock. And uh, I thought well, it'd be nice to keep the rods out for that length of time, you know, maybe get an afternoon bite off these carp. And uh, fortunately, I didn't have to wait quite that long. My waders were all rolled up at the side of my bed chair. I've got a cup of coffee on the go. Jim was chilled out at the, uh, in fact, Jim was intently watching the water at that time, if I remember rightly, and he was, uh, he, he was whining occasionally, and I don't know what was wrong with him, whether he wanted a walk or something, but I was thinking, time's coming, that I might have to reel these rods in, and I've had a single bleep. I've looked down, I've started to put my waders on, and I've had another bleep and I've watched the weed start to lift out of the water and uh, I knew it was away. I've legged it down to the rod, dragging my waders with me. I've picked the rod up, pulled into it and the lines just slice straight out to the spot. There's a big eruption and the reel is fizzing. Like I've, I've literally clamped down on the spool and there's it's ripping line. I don't know how, maybe 15 yards, and uh, you know, felt unstoppable at the time. It's flat rodded me. I couldn't do anything. I'd taken a couple of steps forward, and my saving grace was the big weed bed at the back of the spot because this fish just buried into that weed. Um, I felt it go in there, and uh, everything came to a bit of a stalemate for a period of time. I held the rod under full compression, and I remember thinking, right, use this time to get your waders on. So I've slipped the waders on pulled ones, rod still under full compression. And um, you could hear the line singing in the wind. You know, I've got this southerly wind blowing and you can hear the line start singing. So, you know, I've got that, I've got a lot of tension on that line. I made the conscious decision just to take a few steps back, take every bit of stretch out, keep the pressure on, no retreat, no surrender under these circumstances. Um, you know, I had a line of uh, boys, um, I was, you know, fishing, um, my side of the ski lane but there was a big line of chained up boys out there and a big scaffold tower out to my left long snaggy margins either side of me you know I had to do what I had to do with this uh, with this scenario I've done it hundreds of times in the same swim landed carp from uh, all manner of um, situations on there and so you know it was just going through the motions for me at that particular moment in time but this felt like a, a big powerful carp in the weed at range and I needed to get it moving. So another step back, held the rod under full compression, felt a kick and uh, I can remember just looking out on this, um, this choppy water and seeing this enormous eruption and I mean it was big, like long, there was a, a big sort of head one side, I could see the tail the other side, this was a, a big carp. It's exited the weed, went on a left-hand kite, and I managed to get in the water, because I had got my waders on by this point, got in the water, got down the left-hand margin, put a load of side on it, and fortunately, she's turned, as, a, you know, as I say, I've caught a lot of fish from that swim, she's turned and headed for the deep water on a right-hand kite, real quick, accelerating all the while. You know, I knew she was running into my favour at this point. Anything left was disastrous, right was brilliant. Um, so things were going my way. She eventually um, weeded me up again for a short period of time, 
managed to get her out and uh, I think by this point I'd probably pumped her back into around 40 odd yards out. Um, I've got this big shallow bay to my left full of weed up to the surface um, and she started to, to kite left rapid again um, but by this time I could sort of see and I could just see this great big glowing submarine charging into this surface weed to my left hand side and I think it was at that point that the doubt slipped out of my mind and, um, and I was pretty convinced at that point that I was attached to the Burfield Common. Um, my mouth had gone dry, the old legs were a little bit shaky but as I say I'd done this a lot of times, this, if this was going to be my moment I needed to remain calm and just get the get this job done. She weeded me up for a little while in this in this bay to the left and uh, I managed to gain some line on her and she came through on the inside line. I've got one rod left out, remember I was only using two rods. Um, I've got one rod left out pinging out to me spot and she's, she's come past me, probably no more than two rod lengths out. Um, I could see her eye, I could see it, and now I'm under no illusions as to what I'm attached to. It's the Burfield Common. Uh, like the, the, the feeling is, is, is indescribable, but I, I, I think due to my job and the things that I've done through life, that, that enabled me to keep that cool head at that time because, you know, the amount of work I'd put in, I, I, I always thought if I hook that fish and see it before I put it in the net, I'm going to go to pieces. But fortunately, I kept my head and um, she's gone underneath the other line, got the rod tip down. I was praying that she didn't come up over the top of it. I was prepared to cut that line and go out and retrieve the, the rig later if she did. But she came back underneath the line and uh, with a few lunges under the tip, I had the net ready and, and this was going to be the final moment. But no, I've gone to net her and she's exploded off of the net. This fish is so long. Um, yeah, like, you know, she weren't going to go in without a fight. She, she weren't ready. So uh, again, another little run up and down in the margins. And uh, I've turned her over, managed to get the net right under. I sort of shuffled her in. Uh, made sure the tail was in and, and she just sunk into that net. I sunk to my knees, I've thrown the rod into the reeds and, uh, and I've just put my I just wanted to touch her just to make sure the moment was real <laughs> and, uh, and of course it was. Um, I staked the net out, legged it to me, uh, me bivvy, put a sack, because it's sunny, I put a sack over the top of the net and as I'm out there doing this um, I've heard a voice behind me and I didn't even recognise the fella, but it was a good friend of mine, Dean. Uh, and he's like, what you got there, mate? And I'm like, yeah, I've got the common, man. And he's like, oh, common, oh, well done. You're like, do you want a picture? I'm like, mate, it's the common. And he's like, looked at me, looked at me again, and what, what, the common? And I'm like, yeah, mate, it's, it's the big common. And uh, he was like overjoyed for it, it was brilliant. You know, he looked after the fish. I made the phone call to my missus. And then I phoned two really good friends that I'd met up on the lake, Stuart and Ian. I'd always said to Stuart, would he do the pictures for me if ever I was lucky enough to catch it? And he said, yeah, of course I will. And uh, sure enough, um, they came down and yeah, uh, a moment that I'll never forget. The Burfield Common, 55 pound, four ounces um, from the swim that I'd worked so, so hard for. You know, the first time that fish had been caught past Barnet's Point in that in that area of the lake, so uh, that that was a special moment for me. You know, um, I sort of I hoped it could be done. I sort of knew it could be done. It now had been done, and it just added even more value to the capture if there could be any more value. Um, you know, that that moment, that that precious time spent with such a magnificent carp. Uh, can, can never be repeated, it's a once in a lifetime thing and for me, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, it's my, my finest moment in angling.